Welcome to Hosanna's online worship service. We're very glad you could join us for this and be a part of the body of Christ here in Mesa, Arizona. Even if you're not here in person, even if you can't uh, come because of safety issues, we're glad you could join us in, in at least this way and be a part of our community. Um, since you are online and on our YouTube channel, I invite you to, um, first of all, like the video, uh, subscribe to the channel and then comment on the video uh, anything that strikes your fancy something you love about Hosanna something about the sermon something about the music whatever it is um, feel free to comment those things and it helps YouTube know that this video is worth sharing with other people and it will increase the reach of these videos so that more people can hear about the love of Jesus for them at this time we're going to now begin with our invocation and so we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's now pray together our prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's now sing together a song of praise to our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind.
We continue now with our readings, and both of our readings for today, both the Old Testament and the Gospel reading, really focus on the idea of unconditional love, loving people beyond what they deserve, loving your enemies, and the amazing things that God can do through that sort of love. And so I want you to listen for that theme of God's grace, God's amazing love in these passages. So our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 45, verses 3 through 15. <coughs> and Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you. For there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. Now your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of, of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. He fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, the sixth chapter, verses 27 through 38. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse for you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer also the other. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now sing another song of praise to our God.
peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I was watching this TV show one time, and um, there were two characters, and someone asked them if they were dating. <laughs> and she responds with, no, 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 no. <laughs> and through this whole thing, he's just sitting there staring at her. And when she wraps up, he goes, really? 17 no's? And I was thinking about that because I feel like this is my response to Jesus' command in our gospel reading. <laughs> this is my response and probably his response to me, you know? Jesus tells us, love your enemies. And I go, no, 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 no. And he's looking at me going, really? 17 no's? But the thing is, this is this is a difficult command to keep because this is exactly the opposite of what makes sense to us, right? What makes sense to us is you hate your enemies and you love those who love you. But that's not at all what Jesus says. He's, he's actually flipping the script and saying, I need you to do something that is counterintuitive. I need you to do something that makes no sense at all. And so here's what Jesus says. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you and bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. <coughs> think about that a moment. Because we, we think, love your enemies. And then we like to leave it nice and vague. And not really think about who our enemies are. And that helps us kind of gloss over the fact that we're not really loving our enemies. And so I want you to take a moment and think, who are my enemies? Who consider themselves my enemy? Who would I consider my enemy? Who are those who would abuse me, who would curse me, who hate me? Who are those people? And for me personally, the first kind of group of people, I'm not going to mention anyone specific, but the first group of people that comes to mind for me um, are the people who mischaracterize me and my intentions because I am a Christian. Because I do try and do this. I do try and love my enemies. I try and, and be caring and generous and supportive of all sorts of people. And I know I'm not good at it. I really, I'm not. I, I fail on so many levels to, to love people who disagree with me, who are, I just look at them and go, really? Uh, and and I know I have my blind spots. I know how I have those areas where I just, I am not considerate of people and I'm not good at loving people and I'm working on that. But the problem is that the, with those people who mischaracterize me, they don't care if I'm working on it. They don't care how hard I'm trying or what I'm trying to do or, or what I actually want. They only take this tiny little clip of me and who I am and say, look at that. That is just the worst thing awful ever. And maybe it is something where I slipped up, or maybe it's something they don't understand, but they don't care about any of that. They just care that they can attack me, and they can mischaracterize me, and they can throw all sorts of shade my way and, and hate me for who I am. And ah, uh, makes my blood boil. Because all that leaves behind is, is they start lying to other people about me, and all it leaves is mistrust. And, and it just hinders everything that I try and do for anyone else. And this is, this is the big one for me, right? These are the people who I really consider my enemies, who hate me just because of who I am as a follower of Jesus. But, but there are lots of other people who, you know, I might consider my enemies, right? Uh, the person who pulls out in front of me on the freeway and then proceeds to go 10 miles an hour slower than the speed limit. Or how about the person who, who is calling you and... Uh, that they're calling because they have a question about your car's extended warranty? Or what about the person, um, <laughs> on a more serious note, what about a person who is from the other political party, whose ideas are nothing but dumb? And I don't care what side of the aisle you land on because, honestly, both sides think that about the other side. They can't possibly conceive of how someone on the other side would think so dumb about such an obvious issue and it leads to a very adversarial thing. And we create enemies, whether real or imagined. And so we have all these 
enemies in our life. And Jesus says, love your enemies. Love them. It's those people that we need to love. Which begs a new question, right? What does it mean to love them? What, do, what should we be doing for them? And Jesus has that covered as well. He tells us to love them by giving to them generously. To, and this is kind of the second section of our reading where he says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? If you love someone and they reciprocate your love, this is what we call a healthy relationship. Those people aren't your enemies. Those are your friends, your brothers and sisters. I mean, in Greek, we talk about this all the time, right? There are multiple words for love in Greek. And the big ones that we talk about are uh, phileo, which is that brotherly love, that companionship, that um, you, know, you, you care for someone deeply, and they do the same for you. And then you've got eros, which is a romantic love, which is designed for marriage. And those are loves that are reciprocated, right? The love you pour into the relationship is something that you should be getting a return on. You should be loved back. You should be receiving, you know, the same kind of care and affection from those people. It's the third type of love, agape love, which is selfless love, self-sacrificial love, where we love other people and don't expect anything back from them where we give them, we care for them, we do everything we can imagine to help them, and don't expect a return. And this is what Jesus calls us to. He says, don't expect a return. Give to them and give more to them and allow them to continue to harm you, to abuse you. When they strike one cheek, turn the other. When, when they take from you, don't, don't ask for it back. And, and he, he says, lend to people without expecting them not just to not pay interest, but to not pay back the, the original loan in the first place. Just give to them, give, give, give generously. And this is the call of Jesus, to, to love everyone with such an extreme love that you are just, you've forgotten completely about yourself and you're caring all about them and what they need. And so this is what Jesus calls us to in our reading. This is what he tells us that we should be doing, how we should be living our lives. But the thing to remember is, is that this isn't just Jesus sitting high and mighty on his throne, looking down on us and saying, this is what you guys should do. This command is what Jesus lived. Think about it. The, the, the first part that he talked about, right? Love your enemies. Can you think of a time when Jesus loved his enemies? If you're thinking about yourself, you would be correct. Because Jesus, because sin, sin makes us an enemy of God. Sin, by very definition, is rebellion against God and his word and makes us enemies of the state. We are God's enemies because of our sinfulness, because we have broken his laws. We deserve condemnation and death. And yet, he loves us. He desires what's good for us. He desires to give us life. And so he lived out that love. He lived out the self-sacrificial agape love that he commands from us. And he lived that out on the cross when he came and he suffered and he died. And in so doing, he gave everything for us, his enemies. In our reading, Jesus talks about, you know, paying for giving someone a loan and, and kind of this monetary idea. But what he did, he did pay a debt, but it wasn't a debt that could be paid in money. It was a debt that could only be paid in blood, in his perfect and holy blood. <laughs> Jesus came and paid for our sins. Us, his enemies, he came and paid for our sins so that we can have life. And he doesn't expect us to return that payment, to, to somehow pay for our sins as well and live up to that expectation. No, he gives to us generously and says, here, take what I have to offer. Take my love, take my forgiveness, take my righteousness, and I will take your burdens and your pain and your sorrow and your suffering and everything that you've done wrong, everywhere that you have failed to live up to my standard, to love as I have called you, 
that's okay. I have taken responsibility for that. So when Jesus tells us to love our enemies and to love them recklessly and selflessly, this isn't an arbitrary command. This is what he lived. And all he's doing is saying, do as I have shown you. Do as I have done. Love other people to the extreme. And so it leaves us with a question. Actually, it leaves us with two questions, right? Who do we love and how do we love them? And the first question is something we've already talked about a lot, right? We, you love your enemies. But again, we can't leave that vague, so we give ourselves no, no excuse to say, well, I think I did that, when all we've done is tolerate the people we sort of like, right? No, love everyone. And I can think of no better example in our current kind of cultural climate than in politics, right? It, in our politics, it's so disheartening to see the level of antagonism that each side has for each other. And everyone in the middle is antagonistic too. And it just seems to be that we are in the middle of a cold civil war. And when you're at war, you have enemies. You have people who, who need to be destroyed. If not literally taking their lives, then at least literally taking all their power and their livelihood and everything away from them. And this is where we stand. This is what is going on politically in our nation. And unfortunately, this has leaked into our churches where we let these perspectives leak into how we behave as Christians, how we choose to love people. We don't keep politics out of the church. We invite it in, and we allow that to keep us from loving people, from loving people who would be considered our enemies, who consider themselves our enemies for the things that we do and the things that we believe. And we fail to love our enemies. And this happens on every level. People who hate you for the way that you are, for a conflict and a relationship that you have had, whatever it is, all these enemies, every single person is someone that Jesus has called us to love. <coughs> and so we know who we love. That's everyone, without exception. But how do we love them? What do we do for them? And again, here, we follow Jesus' example. We self-sacrificially give them whatever they need. Now, there's the nuance of the situation. There's the, the little rub, because we need to give them what they need. And that's a delicate balance. Because as I'm reading through what Jesus says, he says, give to everyone who begs from you. And as I read that, in my mind, what, what sort of people do we see begging in our world here, here where we live today, right? We see people standing on the street corner with a sign. People whom I have never given a cent to nor anything else. I just kind of, you know, keep my head down and pretend like I don't see them. And it's not because I don't want to help them. I think my logic in, in saying this is because I can't give them what they need. I can only give them what they're asking for, what they want. And so instead I try and give to places and institutions who can help give them what they need, who can help people get back on their feet and get to a good life instead of just simply living on charity. And so that's that's kind of one of the nuances that I see. And so it, you have to be, what this requires is a lot of wisdom, a lot of wisdom to ask, what do people need? What, what, what are my blind spots? How do I not see their needs? How am I accidentally harming them? And what can I do for them to actually help them? Uh, another example that I think of, um, so after last week's sermon, when I talked about how we as the church sometimes harm families and parents who come to church by being, uh, let's say, less than generous. I was talking about this with Michaela, and she pointed something out to me, is that my generation, you know, the generation of parents, we have this tendency to be, um, over anxious about what other people think of us. 
And we were talking about it, and we're like, yes, this is exactly us, too. This is me and Michaela. We, we over-worry about what other people think. And so, you know, our kid is running around at church. Someone looks at them, and we interpret that as a glare. And they're thinking, are they going to run into my bum knee, and is it, am I going to be limping for a week now? And they weren't thinking anything, but we interpret it as a glare. And so it would be very easy for us as the church to, to write that off and say, well, that's their problem. They're, they're way overthinking this. But we need to love them. We need to go above and beyond and say, not only what do they need, what can we do to help? How can we help support them? Which requires something of us, not just tolerance, but extending a welcoming hand, going to these families and parents and saying, hey, is there anything I can do to help you out? Uh, we have busy bags in the back of church. Would you like me to show you where those are? Or maybe you go to the Dollar Tree, you buy a pack of stickers, and then you say to parents, hey, I have these stickers. Do you want your kids to have stickers? I don't mind. I, I have these extras. And you give the kids something to do, something to show the parents, hey, I'm trying to help you out. I love you. I love that you're here, and I want you to be here. How do we go above and beyond? How do we see people for what they truly, deeply need and help them with that? Sometimes it looks to the world like we are being unloving because the world loves its sin. And if you don't support the world and its sin, it's not going to accept you. It's not going to, to happily say, oh yeah, you're trying to help me get rid of my... No, the world clings tenaciously to its sin. And so a call to repentance, which is a difficult thing to hear, is sometimes the most loving thing we do. And it will make us enemies. It will make us... It will make people say, you are the worst. You are awful. You are just trying to hurt me. You are trying to destroy my life, my identity, who I am. You're trying to take that away from me. And we say, no, I'm trying to love you because I see a bigger picture. And I've been loved way beyond what I deserve. I know this guy, Jesus, who has changed me forever. He loved me when I didn't deserve it. And I want you to have his love. In his name, amen. Now may the grace of God, which transcends all of our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus always.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the love that you have shown us, that while we are still your enemies, while we are still so undeserving of your love and grace, you have loved us anyway. You have made us holy. You have glorified us. You have given us your righteousness and taken our sin away. We thank you for that gift. And we ask that you would guide us to live like you, to live recklessly and fearlessly, to love other people, regardless of who they are, how they see themselves to us, how they might treat us. Help us to love them as you have loved us, so that they may come to know your grace too and live in your glory. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for all who are dealing with issues with their family, dealing with drama, with people who are uh, being stubborn and hurtful and whatever else might happen. We ask that you would be with them. Give them strength in all the conflict that is going on. Give them peace knowing that you love them and that we here love them and that they are not alone. And we ask that you would bring resolution to these things so that everyone might get the help that they need and that you might be glorified in all. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we pray for all who are dealing with every sort of sickness and disease and injury of the body, whether that is it comes from an illness or disease or um, comes from some sort of accident or from malicious intent. Be with all who are dealing with these different maladies of the body. Give them strength to press through, give them healing so that they may be restored and, and their pain might be taken away. And, and remind them of your promise that this suffering is temporary in light of the resurrection promise that we have. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for all church workers, all pastors um, and leaders of their congregations, for all teachers, DCEs, DCOs, and everyone else who works in and with the church. Be with them in their leader posi leadership positions in your body. Guide them so that they might be faithful to their calling and that their actions might glorify you and show your love to the world so that those in our congregations and those outside of them might hear your promises and your love and might glorify you in turn. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray together the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Go in God's peace, for we are his children. Amen. Yeah. 
you fight me all my fears and failures oh fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I Savior, he can 